I'm here to talk about teaching analysis better and teaching analysis better in legal research and writing. So here is a list of the forms of reasoning that lawyers typically engage in. And in legal research and writing, we tend to focus on those on the left side of, of my slide. Makes sense? We're dealing with a rule-based system and with the common law. And speaking for myself, I don't do a great deal with policy-based reasoning. I do a little in my advocacy semester. But I have not explicitly incorporated uh, narrative or inferential reasoning into my course. And by inferential, I mean the inferences that lawyers make from facts, the absence of facts, and then also from case law. So the first thing I want to do today is suggest that we all work to get past rule-based and analogical reasoning and start explicitly incorporating these forms of reasoning into our curriculum so that students are familiar with the terminology. Today, Ruth Ann Robbins is going to talk a little bit about how to think about teaching narrative reasoning and how it goes beyond formulating fact statements and actually can be incorporated into legal argument. For the rest of my talk, I'd like to focus on how we teach rule-based reasoning. It's a nice dovetail with what Lucy Jewell was just talking about, and also Professor Ho talking about the formulation of IRAC. So in legal research and writing, we tend to teach rule-based reasoning, which is comprised of induction and deduction. We teach induction generally as rule synthesis. And so we tend to tell students that, as a practitioner, what we are trying to do is put cases together from a given jurisdiction to represent the law at a given point in time. And we're going to take little holdings or pieces of these cases, synthesize or assimilate them to induce a general rule. Then we teach deduction as the application of that general rule, moving from now general to specific, and we're going to apply that rule to the facts and circumstances of our client situation to come up with a conclusion that's either a prediction or an argument. And over the last 10, 15 years or so, we have developed a fairly sophisticated pedagogy for explaining how to organize analysis, and we use any one of these iterations of uh, IRAC. Uh, IRAC was first, of course, in legal research and writing. We have a, just a boatload of them now. They all basically mean the same thing. <laughs> uh, my text happens to use CREAC, so it's conclusion first, rule, which you state, you explain the rule, apply it, and then uh, conclude. And there's a nice article I have cited there if you want to read about the development of these uh, acronyms. Well, I find that the acronyms can be sort of a love them or hate them situation. So we have students who find them incredibly useful. They find them useful because they are a concrete guide for organizing analysis. They are the ball that we often are accused of hiding, yet uh, I find that students latch on to this formula and they can be misled into thinking that if all they do is organize their analysis in this fashion, they're engaging in sophisticated reasoning. I even have students at this point in the year who are thinking and speaking in CREA. And honestly, it makes me cringe. <laughs> I made Michelle laugh, that's good. Um, now, I have students who don't like the acronym, and the reason they don't like it is because, well, for some of the same reasons the students like them. And one is they think it makes their writing seem rigid. I mean, they think it makes them seem formulaic. There's no room for creativity, and they've lost their voice, and they lose interest in teaching writing. So I'm not here, in learning to write, I should say, I'm not here to say we should abandon these acronyms, because I've been a big proponent of them. I think they're useful. They are the first step toward trying to teach students what deductive 
analytical reasoning is all about. But my concern is that without more, we are misleading students into thinking that analysis is equivalent to arranging sentences in a set order. It's not enough for them to learn how to assemble analysis. I think we want them to understand how analysis works, how the pieces work together as a whole, and how deduction works. Now, Lucy Jewell mentioned this property as well. I had to look it up. I did not remember. It was called the transitive property of equality, but I do remember the concept, and it's helpful. You'll notice it's the comparison of three terms. If we know something about the relationship of the three terms, we can figure out some new information. So if we know that A is equal to B, and we know that B is equal to C, we can then deduce that A is equivalent to C. In philosophical terms, these acronyms represent legal reasoning that is akin to the categorical syllogism. Now, in philosophy, the categorical syllogism, the iconic one is the one that Lucy Jewell uh, showed in her presentation before about the mortality of Socrates. And the theory behind syllogisms is that if you have a major premise and a minor premise, and both of those premises are indisputably true, and your logic is valid, then you can apply the major premise to the minor premise and have an indisputably true conclusion. In the law, our premises are never indisputably true. And we can explain to students, and I'm thinking now about how Lucy articulated this in such a nice way about how logic can lead to injustice. We can teach students that the premises they use must be reasonable. And if the premises are reasonable and their logic is valid, the import of their prediction or their argument will have the same impact that a categorical syllogism would have. And that is uh, the power behind the syllogism. Sometimes our creative students want to change things up a bit. They want to be clever. They don't want to be stuck in this rigid pattern of presenting their analysis in the same way all of the time. And they tend to think in paragraph format. So what they'll do is they will change things up a bit. And instead of giving you rule application conclusion, in essence, they'll do something like apply the rule, give you their conclusion, and then throw the rule in at the end. And what we can explain to students is that this violates the expectation of the legal reader. If we're used to seeing something presented in a way that is equivalent to A plus B equals C, and you give your reader C equals A plus B, then that forces the legal reader to stop and rearrange that information in a way that they expected to, to receive it, and then they can try to process that information. The key at this point, I think, is then explaining to our students that the creativity in rule-based reasoning, and there are all kinds of forms of reasoning, but the creativity in rule-based ba reasoning does not lie in the arrangement of the analysis. It lies in the formulation of the rules or the premises and in the application of the rules to a specific situation. So what do I mean by that? Well when students are synthesizing rules, which cases do you, as the author of this analysis, think best represent the rule of the law in this jurisdiction at this moment in time? Which ones will you cite in support of your rule? Is your rule going to be broad? Is it going to be narrow? Why might you construct a rule that was more or less broad? Which cases best represent those like yours that you want to devote space to in your analysis to analogize? Which cases present enough of a problem that you will want or need to distinguish those? And then how much case law per issue do you want to devote to your analysis? 
how much does each issue or sub-issue deserve in terms of treatment? These are the questions, the right brain work, we heard about left brain, right brain this morning. This is the right brain work that we want our students engaging in, not worrying about what has already been figured out, and that is the best way to present logical rule-based analysis. So here are some helpful resources that can be used outside the classroom or as uh, sources of information for flipped classrooms that can help our students understand how deductive reasoning works. The first three are specific to legal reasoning. The last is simply a good traditional text on uh, appeals to logic and uh, deductive reasoning. So in closing, I'd just like to say that first, I think we need to work towards incorporating all forms of reasoning into our curricula. Second, I think we need to explain to students that the acronyms we use to teach rule-based reasoning are representative of an analytical process. They are not a formula for writing paragraphs. And finally, we want them to understand that the creativity in rule-based reasoning lies in the content of the analysis and not in its arrangement. Thank you.